Senator Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for appearing here today. Thank you, Secretary Carson, in particular, for coming down to Arkansas earlier yes. this year. Um, I want to return to an issue that Senator Toomey uh, touched upon, and that's restrictions on supply in housing, and especially local restrictions. It sounded like we had some agreement between Senator Toomey, uh, a well-known uh, conservative mind when it comes to housing and finance policy, and our Republican witnesses. Um, I just want to read from another statement about these restrictions and get your response to them, in particular Secretary Carson and Mr. Calabria. Locally constructed barriers to ho new housing development include beneficial environmental protections or well-intentioned permitting processes or historic preservation rules, but also laws plainly designed to exclude multifamily or affordable housing. Local policies acting as barriers to housing supply include land use restrictions that make developable land much more costly than it is inherently, zoning restrictions, off-street parking requirements, arbitrary or antiquated preservation regulations, residential conversion restrictions, and unnecessarily slow permitting processes. Secretary Carson, does that sound like a pretty good catalog of local restrictions that reduce affordable housing supply? That sounds like a good catalog. And interestingly enough, what we've observed is in areas that have the greatest affordable housing needs and the largest number of homeless people, we have the largest number of restrictions. Uh, if you look at a place like San Francisco, the median home price in the San Francisco Bay Area is $1.6 million. <laughs> And you, you look at Los Angeles with the requirements for solar panning. And a, a lot of this, quite frankly, is uh, because of NIMBYism. You know, not in my backyard, but NIMBYism is actually based on archaic thinking. They believe that the federal government still acts the way that it used to. You know, building these gigantic complexes with little forethought, afterthought, or intermediate thought or support. Uh, and that's not what's done anymore. Now we're talking about public-private partnerships. We're talking about uh, multiple incomes. We're talking about conforming to the uh, architectural and cultural uh, issues in the area. We're not talking about putting a multifamily house or a complex in the middle of single-family neighborhood. People have wrong impressions of what we're doing. We actually care about what people think, but it can be done in the right way so that firemen and policemen and nurses can live in the same neighborhood where they work. I think that actually enhances the community. Uh, Mr. Calabria? Uh, let me say, you know, I, I very fully agree, and I think part of the problem is, particularly in places like California, the process just has multiple vetoes where people can object and object to construction, and you do need streamlining of that. Uh, that said, I think we should look to cities that have done a good job, as Senator Smith is aware, Minneapolis recently has upzoned, and, and I think done a very smart move, mover there on a local level that will help affordable housing in that area. So I think there are good lessons to learn as well as some lessons to learn in cities that don't work. Well, that long catalog of local restrictions that uh, retard the supply of affordable housing comes from none other than Barack Obama's White House uh, housing plan in September of 2016. So I hope now that we have agreement between Barack Obama, Mark Calabria, Ben Carson, and Pat Toomey that we could try to address this problem perhaps by looking at ways to condition grants on more affordable housing policies at the Absolutely. local level. Another local policy, of course, is education policy. Uh, anybody who has a child that's been going into school knows the pressure of getting in a good school district. I want to read a few quotes from a well-known book about the stress on middle-class families. In the overwhelming majority of cases, a bureaucrat picks the child's school, not a parent. The way for parents to exercise any choice is to buy a different home, which is exactly how the bidding wars started. The crisis in education if not only, is not only a crisis of reading and arithmetic, it is also a crisis of middle-class family economics. At the core of the problem is the time-honored rule that where you live dictates where you go to school. Any policy that loosens the ironclad relationship between location, 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 and school, school, school would eliminate the need for parents to pay an inflated price for a home just because it happens to lie within the boundaries of a desirable school district. A well-designed voucher program would fit the bill neatly. Fully funded vouchers would relieve parents from the terrible choice of leaving their kids in a lousy school or bankrupting, bankrupting themselves to escape those schools. If a meaningful public school voucher system were instituted, the U.S. housing market would change forever. Gentlemen, those quotes are from Smith Warren. Senator Warren's book from 2003 in support of a school voucher program. I know that you don't do education policy, but do you agree 
that local education rules can negatively impact affordable housing prices. Uh, I do, and let me also say uh, her passages in that book on housing subsidies are a delightful read that I would encourage members of the committee to take a look at. I know my time's expired, but perhaps you can find an ally on the other side of the aisle, along with Secretary DeVos, to both improve the quality of education in America and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you.